The subject of our address this evening is, if Christ died for us, why do we die? And as an introductory reading to our speaker's address this evening, he has asked that we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 12 to 23. That reading is an introduction to the remarks of our speaker will address us to the subject, if Christ died for us, why do we die? Thank you, Brother Chairman, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, as the Chairman has announced, we have this question before us this evening, if Christ died for us, why do we die? It is possible, ladies and gentlemen, to give a very simple explanation, a simple answer to that question, a brief answer. And the brief answer is this. Because God is going to reward all the faithful with immortality at the same time, after mankind's 6,000 years probationary period on the earth has expired, he's going to reward all the faithful at the same time, then, of course, it follows, does it not, that although Christ has died for us, nevertheless, faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ will continue to die until the expiration of that 6,000 year probationary period. It is the purpose of raising the responsible dead and bestowing immortality on the faithful simultaneously that Christ will soon return to the earth. So while Christ died for us, the faithful, together with all others, will continue to die until the time of Christ's second coming. Now that's the simple, that's the brief answer to the question we are going to consider this evening. But of course, you would, as you would expect, we will set out for you a more detailed explanation of the subject. And what I'm willing, I hope, to do this evening is to take you through this diagram. All right? And we're going to go through the diagram from left to right, cross like this. And this diagram actually covers a period of 6,000 years from the creation of Adam here until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, his second appearing or his second coming over here. And while that is what the diagram sets it out, it doesn't set it out in terms of a time scale. In other words, you're not coming across like that. It is in fact sequential, but the scale of the, uh, of the diagram is not according to time. And so what we're going to start this evening, we're going to start over here with the creation of Adam and Eve by God. And the Bible reveals that Adam and Eve were created on the sixth day of the creation week. They were in fact the last creatures that God created. And the Bible tells us that in the end of the sixth day, we read in Genesis chapter 1 and at verse 31, that God saw that everything, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you that you can see for yourself, you can see for yourself, that the earth and mankind, the creation, is not in a very good condition today. The earth and humans are not in a very good condition. For example, we have a lifespan of 60, 70, 80, perhaps 90 years. We suffer from all sorts of diseases. We are mortal. We die. But this was not how God created the first human pair. When God created them, they were not mortal. They were not subject to death. They didn't get sick like we get sick today. And so what we need to do is, we need to see what happened. And what happened is this, that God gave certain laws to Adam and Eve. 
When God created them, he placed them in the Garden of Eden and he said, now look, there are certain things that you must not do. For example, in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, we read, And the Lord God commanded the man, commanded Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And what is meant by that is explained in the margin. If you've got an Oxford Bible and it's got a margin, it will tell you that the meaning of that is that dying thou shalt die. It's not that Adam and Eve uh, were going to die like that, but they will become dying creatures. Eventually they would pass back into, uh, into dust. They would decay. They would die and form, go back into, into the dust of the ground. So disobedience would mean the death which was only originally a possibility, would then become a certainty if they sinned. That's how the Bible sets it out for us. Unfortunately, we know what happened. We know that disobedience uh, was practiced by Adam and by Eve. And so we read in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. And when the woman, when Eve saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. This was the tree which God said, don't touch it, don't eat of it. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And so what we now have, ladies and gentlemen, is we have sin entering into the world. That's what we have. We have disobedience. And... This consequence of sin is shown on the diagram as the fall and death reigns. So let's go back to our diagram. There is the creation of Adam and Eve. Adam in particular as shown on this chart. They are in a state of innocence. They are in a very good state. This sun up here represents God. It represents God and here we have the creation of Adam. They are in a very good state. They're not subject to death. Uh, they're not immortal, but they're not subject to death. They're not suffering from disease and sickness and all sorts of other things like that. But God said, well, if you disobey, then you're going to become dying creatures. You're going to die eventually after a period of time. And so we've got here the fall. Now, the fall is not a biblical expression, but it's just an expression which we use to say that Adam and Eve fell from the very good condition in which they were in into a state in which death reigned. Here it is down here. Death reigns. Alright? So, as I say, as a consequence of sin, as shown on the diagram, we have the fall and we have death reigning. Let's look at this a little more closely. We won't actually look up Romans chapter 5, verses 15 and 18, but in fact in Romans chapter 5, in these verses, there is a contrast between the blessings which a person can obtain in Christ and what happens to people who are in Adam. And ladies and gentlemen, all of us by birth are in Adam. Every one of us here in the room this evening is in Adam. And Paul shows in Romans 5, verses 15 to 18, that through Adam's disobedience, through the disobedience of one man, many be dead. In fact, the whole of the creation is mortal and is passed into death. Through the offence of Adam, many be dead. Paul says that through the sin of Adam, through the offence of Adam, death reigns. Death is supreme. No one can escape from death. Given time that goes on, if you get to be if today, 60 or 70 or 80 or 90, even 100 years old, you will eventually die. Death will reign. Death will have dominion over you. And the Apostle Paul also says in those verses in Romans chapter 5 that because of Adam's sin, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. In other words, we are descendants of Adam. We're going to die anyway. We might die when we're three minutes, three months, three years old. We live not very long, we will sin, we will die. There's no question about that. Judgment came upon all men to condemnation. So as I say, in these verses, Paul is contrasting the curse 
which comes through being in Adam, with the blessing which can occur to people when they are in Christ. Now, how did this come about? How did the state of things come about? Well, Genesis 3, verses 17 to 19, this is what we read. And unto Adam, he that is God, said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. And so shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Now, before I go off this slide, I want you to notice something. He said originally that when God created the heaven and the earth in the six days that it is set out in uh, Genesis chapter 1, when he created Adam and Eve, everything was in a very good state. The earth did not produce thorns and thistles. Right? It did not produce thorns and thistles. But as a consequence of Adam's sin, there were what we call, what I call anyway, physiological changes. And if you find the word physiological a little bit difficult, then just think of it in terms of physical changes which came about because of the sin of Adam and Eve. Now, we've seen one of the physical changes a moment ago. The earth, which didn't produce thorns and thistles, was going to produce thorns and thistles. All right? Adam himself as we read in the book of Genesis, was created out of the dust of the ground. And just as the ground now produced thorns and thistles, subsequent to Adam's sin, so Adam's body, which was made of the dust of the ground, produced what it had never produced before. Thorns and thistles aren't very pleasant things, are they? They're evil things in a sense. Well, Adam's body also suffered physical or physiological changes, if you like, because of his sin. And so now, man suffered from sickness. Man is now a dying creature. Man now has desires which are evil. They are physiological changes which came about because of Adam's sin. There was still flesh and blood when God created Adam and Eve. They were flesh and blood, we're still flesh and blood, but the condition of our nature, the condition of our bodies, is now different to that of Adam and Eve before they sinned. Consequently, the Bible says that we have bodies that need redemption. That's, we come back to this verse a little later, John willing, in our talk this evening. That's Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. Everybody in this room, as a consequence of Adam's sin, as a consequence of our own sins, so far as that is concerned. But everyone in this room, I don't mind whether we're talking about little children or talking about someone my age or older, everybody has a body which needs redemption if they're going to get eternal life. So at the moment, we are mortal, we are dying, we are sin-inclined creatures because of Adam's sin. Now we need to make this point, ladies and gentlemen, because it's an important point. God is not responsible for man's present condition. And in the epistle of John, in the first epistle of John, right near the end of the New Testament, we read in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16, For all is in the world, all these evil things, lust of flesh, lust of eyes, and pride of life, if you like, mortality as well, because you can't separate those two things, as a matter of fact. All that is in the world, lust of flesh, lust of eyes, pride of life, we can add mortality because, as I say, you can't separate lust of flesh from mortality, is not of the Father. In other words, God is not responsible for the condition in which we find ourselves. Mankind is responsible for that condition. It's not of the Father. This condition in which we find ourselves is not of the Father, but it is of the world. So, unquestionably, because of Adam's sin, the human race is now different 
from how God created man in the first place. We are now subject to death. In our bodies there are propensities, if you like, you can put it another way, there are desires or lusts to do evil. These were not created in human race by God. These propensities are the result of sin. Let's have a look at how the Bible describes man after the fall. If you open your Bibles with me, please, to Ecclesiastes, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29. This is what we read in that verse. This is the wise man Solomon. He says in Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29, Lo, this only have I found, that God made man upright. In the expressions we've already used in the Bible, we can say that God made man in a very good condition. God made man upright. But they have sought out many inventions. Let's go back to the book of Genesis and see what the condition was at the time of the flood. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5 we read this. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's what man had become like as a consequence of sin. The thoughts of their heart were only evil continually. Even an upward flood come across to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 21. This is what we read. And the Lord smelled a sweet savour, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more everything that liveth, as he did in the flood, as I have done. All right? So the imagination of our hearts is evil from our youth. This is a consequence of the sin of Adam back in the garden of Eden. Now, on the chart, this condition is shown in the diagram as the curse Adamic. Here it is down here. So let's just make sure what we're dealing with here. God created Adam and Eve. They were in a very good condition. They sinned, which brought about a before, which is not a biblical expression. It's just an expression we use to uh, designate what happened. Death reigned. And here we've got the curse Adamic. Because everyone who is a descendant of Adam, as we all are, suffers this business, suffers this consequence that we are mortal, that is, we are dying creatures, and associated with that mortality, there's lust of flesh, lust of eyes, and pride of life. And here it's shown on the chart as the curse Adamic. Now, as a matter of fact, down here it says curse mosaic. I haven't time to do with that subject this evening. We don't really need to deal with it in terms of what I'm dealing with this evening. So I'm not going to deal with that, but here is curse Adamic. And it has run from the sin of Adam, and will run right through here to the second appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, when the faithful will be able to escape, they'll be able to get away from this curse Adamic. All right? So... What the Bible, or how the Bible sets this out for us in another way is this. Sin, whether it's a sin of Adam or our own sin, so far as that is concerned, sin creates a gulf between God and ourselves. It created a gulf between God and Adam. And so sin had important implications for man's relationship with God. This is what Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says. It says, But your iniquities, or if you want to put it another way, your sins have separated between you and your God. So sin caused a gulf. Sin caused, put another way, a barrier. And your sins have hid his face from you. In other words, sin has caused us not to be able to look upon in a figurative way the face of God. God hides his face from sinners. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So you see, sin created a gulf, a barrier between God and man. And that barrier, that gulf, express it how you like, was something which man himself 
was unable to breach. There was no way that man himself could breach the gulf or the barrier, get over the barrier. He couldn't do that himself. There was no way man could reconcile himself to God. There was no way that man could save himself. What was needed was an act of love, an act of mercy on the part of God in order that man might have the forgiveness of his sins and ultimately the redemption of his body which has been so badly affected by sin. So man himself was unable to bridge the gulf, he was unable to break down the barrier. So what the Bible sets out is this, that God acted, God acted to provide, to provide salvation for mankind. Here's just one verse, Isaiah 43 and verse 11. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. Now that's the authorised version translation, you can accept that as it is. Beside God there is no, there was going to be no salvation for mankind. The Hebrew actually, actually means, the, the, the Hebrew word translated besides there actually really means without. Beside me, without me, there is no Saviour. In other words, if man was going to be saved, if the gulf was going to be breached, if the barrier was going to be broken down, God had to do it. That's what the Bible teaches. And it's important to understand, ladies and gentlemen, that true religion is God-centred. Now, look, we deeply appreciate, we greatly appreciate the marvellous love of the Lord Jesus Christ which he has shown towards us. But the Bible sets out that true religion is God-centered. It is God who provided the Lord Jesus Christ. And many religions about us, many so-called Christian religions about us in, in the world today, are Jesus-centered religions. That's not Bible teaching. The Bible teaching is that true religion is God-centered. The salvation which is available to mankind originated with God. All right? It originated with God. And God's method of providing salvation was this. He had a special way of providing salvation. And in a minute, we, God willing, we'll see why he did what he did. In a minute, we'll see why it was that Christ had to die. But for a moment, we'll just follow through what God did. And this is what God did. In God's scheme of salvation, there had to be a man who was both son of God and son of man. The name of the man whom God provided was Jesus, a name which means, and bears out what I just said to you a moment ago, we are in a God-centered religion, Jesus actually means God shall say. God shall say. How? Did God provide Jesus? So if you come to me, come with me to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, we have a prophecy about how God was going to provide this special man, this wonderful man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in Isaiah 7 and verse 14, we read this. Therefore, says Isaiah, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. What was going to be the sign that this special man was going to arrive? Well, here it is. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. That's how God was going to do it. When we come to Luke chapter 1, we have another explanation of the same thing. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 33. In Luke chapter 1, and at verse 26, we read this. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God under a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin, ties up with Isaiah 7, doesn't it? To a virgin whose name, uh, who was a spouse to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, Mary was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favour with God. And behold, bear in mind that Mary is a virgin, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. That's what I had already said. Jesus means God shall save. And he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now I just want to reinforce this point that we are in a God-centered religion. What the Bible sets out is that God is the author of salvation. It sets out clear that it is God who has provided salvation. And you know, even the text which I suppose is the best known text, Bible text, well, no matter where you go in, 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 a, in, in, in any sort of country which respects the Bible, the, 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 the verse which most people would know better than any other one is John chapter 3 and verse 16. What does it say? God, for God to so love the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, all right, this fact is shown on the diagram in the middle. We'll have a look at them now in a moment. We just want to make the connection between the Son representing God and the crucifixion, the crucifixion of God's Son. So here it is. We've dealt with the, the creation of Adam. We've dealt with the sin, the fall that entered into the world. We've dealt with the fact that death reigns, and it has reigned from Adam right to to our own time. But during the course of history, God provided his son. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that's represented on the diagram by this cross here. Right? Now, those of you who wonder where this diagram came from, uh, I might just say to you that it is a diagram which was drawn by Robert Roberts, who was a very prominent early Christadelphian. All right? It's Robert Roberts's diagram, which we're actually going through at the moment. So God provided the Lord Jesus Christ. God provided Jesus. Not only that, but it was God's plan that he had to be crucified if the barrier was going to be broken down, the barrier between God and men, if the God was going to be uh, breached, as it were. And so what we need to appreciate, ladies and gentlemen, is this. The crucifixion of Christ was no accident. The crucifixion of Christ was part of God's scheme of salvation. In God's view, it was absolutely essential for the reasons which we will see later that Christ had to die. This is what Acts chapter 2 and verse 22 and 23 says. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves know, he, being delivered by the determinate counsel, and following to God. Now what that is saying is that it might have been wicked hands, as the that part of the verse says, it might have been wicked hands who took the Lord Jesus Christ and for their own reasons crucified him, but crucifixion was nevertheless part of the plan of God. And the Lord Jesus Christ was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, even although it was wicked hands that put him to death. Now, the reason Christ had to die, or at least part of the reason that Christ had to die by crucifixion, was because God in his wisdom had laid down certain fundamental principles right from the beginning. And one of those principles was that without the shedding of blood there could be no remission, that is, no forgiveness of man's sins. You might say, well, look, uh, I wouldn't have done it that way. Well, all right, but none of us here, or no other human, is God. 
It's not something we can argue about, ladies and gentlemen. It's simply a principle which God sets out, which God states that he is going to use in providing salvation for mankind. It's not something we can argue about. It's what the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of men and women has decreed. That if the gulf was going to be breached, if the barrier was going to be broken down, then it was only going to come through the sacrifice, through the shedding of, a, of an innocent man's blood. And because we're not God, we can't say, well, that's not how I would have done it, I've done it some other way. Ladies and gentlemen, we must acknowledge this fact, that God has an understanding of things that we simply do not have. We're not anything like being in the character or the power or the understanding of God. All right? Now, this, in fact, is how the Bible sets it out. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, it says this, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. Genesis 3, that is no remission of sins. In Genesis 3, verse 21, And the Adam and also under his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. And of course, if you're going to make a coat of skin, then blood has got to be shed. Right? So that's a principle which goes right back to Genesis chapter 3. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, the next day, John, that is John the Baptist, see that Jesus coming unto him, and he recognised in Jesus that this was the man that God was going to provide. This was the man whose blood had to be shed if man was going to receive the forgiveness of his sins and the redemption of his body. And he said, when he saw Jesus coming to him, Behold the Lamb of God. It was a, a kind of a reference right back which, to what had been happening all through Old Testament times. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Because from the beginning, slain lambs were the principal animal used in sacrifices to God. Now that's how the Bible sets it out. But the Bible also sets out, ladies and gentlemen, that animal blood, like the blood of lambs, for example, was inadequate. Now it wasn't just any blood that would take away sin. In Old Testament times, animal blood was shed in sacrifice, but those sacrifices were designed to point forward to the ultimate need for the blood of a sinless man to be shed. The animal sacrifices pointed to the to the fact that eventually Christ's blood would have to be shed. Now you come with me if you don't mind please in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10 verses 4 and 5. Hebrews chapter 10 towards the end of the Old Testament, uh, towards the end of the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 4 and 5. For, says the Apostle Paul as he writes to the Hebrews, it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Therefore, when he, that is, when Christ cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. The Lord Jesus Christ was the body prepared. He was going to be the sacrifice which would, pardon, bridge the gulf between God and men, break down the barrier, provide for the forgiveness of man's sins and the redemption ultimately of his body. Conditional, conditional, of course, on what man did. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12 says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, the suffered without the gate. If you just come across a few more pages, the first Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, we read this. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, manner way of life, as the word conversation meant uh, when the authorised version was translated, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. That's not how you're redeemed. Verse 19 tells us how we are redeemed. We're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So you see why John the Baptist refers to the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, 
that takes away the sin of the world. All right? So animal blood was inadequate. It needed Christ's blood. Now there was another principle. Not only did there have to be the shed blood of a sinless man, but in providing for man's salvation, God's righteousness had to be upheld. So I don't quite understand that. Well, let's see what we can do to help in that regard. God's plan of salvation had to uphold his righteousness. Now, if you come with me, to, please, to Romans chapter 3. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. Romans chapter 3. And verses 23 to 26 say this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace, by God's grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, could also be translated a mercy seat, whom he has set forth to be a mercy seat through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness, so you, so you see, the sacrifice of Christ declared God's righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, to the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his, that is, God's righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now, I'm not going to try and expound those verses in detail, but what I want you to notice is that in talking about the provision of salvation for mankind, twice in those verses we have this expression, God's righteousness. And God's plan of salvation for mankind, by God's own decree, had to show that God was right. He was right. And it was right to condemn that which was evil. You see, God was prepared to forgive sin. But what God would not do, could not do, he wouldn't condone sin. He wouldn't go on as if it didn't exist. Sin was a problem. There it was. God was prepared to forgive our transgressions, but he wasn't but to shut his eyes and say, look, this is a problem that doesn't even exist. God had to show that sin was sin. His righteousness, that is, the fact that he was right and his morality was right, had to be upheld. So God would not just condone sin and go on if it didn't exist. It was no good condemning sin without condemning the cause of sin. Now that's what it means when it talks about God's righteousness. God wasn't going to shut his eyes to sin. He was going to condemn sin, but he wasn't just going to do that was also going to condemn the cause of sin, you see. So, where sin originated from after the fall? We know how sin entered into the world. We know what the serpent said to Eve and Eve said to Adam. We know that that was the origin of sin in the garden. But where is the serpent today? Where does sin come from today, ladies and gentlemen. What has got to be condemned? Where does sin come from today? Well, let's have a look. Mark chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. Gospel record by Mark, chapter 7, verses 20 to 23. And he said, this is the Lord said, Jesus said, that which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and the fire of the man. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, sin originates from within us. By physical makeup, as we saw, uh, as a consequence of Adam's 
form. By physical makeup, we are simply inclined. There are propensities, there are lusts, there are urges, there are inclinations in our flesh which lead men to sin, and women to sin, of course, and which a righteous God needed to condemn because this makeup which we now have is the cause, it's the root cause of all the sin and evil and wickedness which is in the world. So God had to do more than just condemn the sin. He had to also do something with that which causes the sin. There's no good condemning the action without well, ignoring the cause. And God's rightness, God's righteousness required him to condemn the cause which is found in our fleshly constitution. Now, that is why, ladies and gentlemen, Christ's sacrificial death was necessary. It would not have been satisfactory if Christ had died, and I'm, I'm not trying to be funny here, so please, this is not a joke, but just bear in mind the environment in which the Lord lived. It would not have been satisfactory if Christ had died in a donkey cart accident. It would not have been satisfactory if Christ had died of old age. It would not have been satisfactory if Christ had died from some illness like appendicitis or something. What was needed in God's scheme of reconciliation of mankind to himself, what was needed was a sacrificial death in which the flesh with its sin proneness was crucified. That's what God needed. That's what upheld God's righteousness. Not just condemning the result, but condemning the cause which led to the result, the cause which leads to sin. And as the Bible sets out so very clearly, Christ had the same flesh and blood nature as ourselves. Now, all right, this fact is shown on the diagram in that the cross is shown dissecting the Adamic curse, the Adamic curse line. This is what we saw before, okay? As a result of Adam and Eve's sin, death reigned. Their bodies which previously hadn't produced evil thoughts uh, and sin and so forth and so on, now did. That was the Adamic curse. They weren't just dying, but they had bodies which were simply inclined, which produced sin. That was the Adamic curse. As I've said before, you actually can't separate mortality and sin cloneness. They both go together. It's the Adamic curse. But something had to happen about that. What had to happen about that is that God required in his scheme of reconciliation that the flesh of a man who had never sinned should be crucified. And flesh needed to be crucified because it is the root cause of all the problems which currently exist in our world. Now we need to reinforce this fact that Christ's nature was exactly the same as ours. New Testament is absolutely insistent that Christ had the same flesh and blood nature as ourselves. He had the same desire to do evil that you and I experience. He was flesh and blood like us. All right? Now the time is actually going faster than I am with this talk, so I'm I'm just going to let you write down, if you like, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. In that verse, we have the devil, and the devil there is simply a synonym for the lusts of our flesh. And Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, which will emphasize the fact that the fleshly constitution of the Lord Jesus Christ was the same constitution which you and I have. And what we also need to recognize is that if we're going to obtain salvation, if we're going to escape from the Adamic curse, then um, we need to recognize that the very first person to escape from the Adamic curse was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. None other than himself. Because he, as we have seen, was the descendant of Adam. That is why when we go back, just go back for a tick if I can. Which way do I go back? Okay, the Lord Jesus Christ was a descendant of Adam. He suffered from the Adamic curse. And because he suffered from the Adamic curse, but he wasn't a sinner, 
then God was prepared under those conditions, and God provided the Lord Jesus Christ as a special man. He was the man who was going to beat this Adamic curse. He was going to demonstrate that what needed, well, what was needed was the crucifixion of the flesh. What had to be condemned as that which leads to sin. All right? So, um, what we find is that Christ was the first to escape from the Adamic curse. Now, if you come with me, please, and I'm going to have to move a little quickly because my time is nearly gone. If you come with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 20. <laughs> This is what we read. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, on what basis was the Lord brought from the dead? On what basis was the Lord able to defeat the mortality which we all experience as the descendants of Adam? Who was brought from the dead, says Hebrews 13 and verse 20, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Just come back with me to Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. For we read this, again the Apostle Paul, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood, by Christ's own blood, he, Christ, entered into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. Now there's two words on the end of the verse which I didn't read. They are the words for us. Most translations of the Bible omit them, and even the authorised version indicates that there are no equivalent words in the original Greek by putting those two words in italics. What Hebrews 9 and verse 12 is saying is that by Christ's own sacrifice, he was able, ladies and gentlemen, he was able to obtain eternal redemption. That's what we want. He's the first person to break the bonds of death. He's the first person to be able to escape Adamic condemnation, to escape from mortality, to be made immortal, you see. So the Lord has escaped the Adamic curse by being raised from the dead and being made immortal. He has ascended to heaven, and in him lies the salvation that God has provided conditionally for other members of the human race. And so often of our source of salvation of anybody in the human race is only available through identification with the risen Christ, the one who has burst the bonds of death, the one who has overcome the Adamic curse, the one who is no longer mortal, the one who no longer has a sin prone constitution. And so in Acts chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, we read this. Be, be it known unto you all, and all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, who God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So the Lord had, so rather, uh, there had been a, uh, a, a miracle in which a person had been cured. This is a stone, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was set in one of your builders, but has become the head of the corner. And Acts chapter 4 goes on to say, Neither is there salvation in any other, there's no other name given under heaven whereby men can be saved, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is only one way to escape Adamic condemnation. There is only one way to get the redemption of our bodies, and that is by identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this fact is shown on the diagram. In the words, Christ's resurrection, saving name, taking out of people, and remission of sin preached in his name. And here it is, over here, all right? So the Lord Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. He ascended to heaven. He is now the saving name, all right? And so we're in this period where God is taking out of the Gentiles and people of his name, and that, ladies and gentlemen, can be us, all right? He's taking out of the Gentiles a people for his name. These people will receive the remission of sins, and that's what is preached today in his name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we preach to people, they can receive the remission of their sins. They can receive the redemption of their body. When will they receive it? When will they receive it? Well, they'll receive it 
as we'll see in a moment, at the second appearing, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But if we're going to identify with this, if we're going to identify with Christ's sacrifice, if we're going to be able to receive the remission of our sins and ultimately the redemption of our bodies, what we've got to do, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to identify with the risen Christ. Come with me, please, to Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 to 9. Romans chapter 6 and verses 3 to 9. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptised into Jesus Christ were baptised in his death. Now we're talking about complete immersion in water when we're talking about being baptised into Christ's death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death and being baptised and being put under the water, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, now that's the description of our body, this body which has got lust of flesh, lust of eyes and pride of life, this body which is mortal, the Apostle Paul here describes as the body of sin, because we are in this condition, ladies and gentlemen, because of sin. We... It's the body of sin because this body produces sin. The body of sin might be destroyed. Actually, it will be back better rendered. It might be rendered powerless. And that's what we've got to aim for. In this period of in which we live, we've got to aim to render this body powerless by the power of the teaching of the Word of God. That henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, in the waters of baptism, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. And that's what we ultimately want to achieve. We want to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ and ultimately receive the redemption of our body. All right? Now, what am I going to do here? All right. I'm just going to give you two texts you can write down. And they're texts which prove that the redemption of our body comes at the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This Philippians, the Apostle Paul actually says that we wait for the redemption of our body. He was waiting for it. We're still waiting for it. Philippians actually 3 and verse 20 says that this body, which is how the authorised version puts it, this body which is subject to Adamic condemnation, the Adamic curse, this vile body shall be changed the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are found worthy, we'll be made like under his glorious body. So this is shown on the chart as Christ's second appearing, death being abolished, the praise to God, no flesh should know in his presence. As I say, this coincides with Christ's establishment of God's kingdom upon the earth. So here is going to happen. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to return from heaven. It's his second is appearing. When he comes... Death will be abolished for his faithful followers. There will no flesh for glory in his presence. And the praise will be to God, who is the author of salvation. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here it is. So although Christ died for us, his followers continue to die until he returns to raise the dead and grant the faithful the redemption of their body in making them immortal beings in God's kingdom on the earth. The Bible teaches that Christ is coming soon. The question for each one of us, ladies and gentlemen, is, are we ready? Are you ready? Am I ready?